Thanks so much for listening to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. You can follow your favorite podcast on social media at Pro Cheerleading Podcast on Instagram, at Pro Cheer Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can support your favorite podcast on Patreon. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sidelines. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. Today, we have a very special episode, one that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Thankfully, this young woman reached out to me and now we are chatting together for this interview to help make this episode come to life. Uh, Everybody, please welcome Madison Forsythe. She is a senior in high school. She is from Mount Holly, North Carolina, and she is a former competitive cheerleader. We're going to find out what her future plans are. I'm hoping that she is still going to be continuing to be a cheerleader. But Madison, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you being here. Hello. It's nice to be here. (laughs) Yeah. So let's just set the stage for everybody about like what actually made you reach out to the podcast and then we'll kind of backtrack to get a little bit more about your cheer story. Um, For a while, it actually took me to not cheer anymore to realize the true issues of the Mm -hmm. African American girls of cheerleading, that it's very mentally and physically draining. And it took me a lot just to say my own story and finally put on Instagram and it encouraged me to want to spread more awareness. So I was like, why not reach out to podcasts? And I came across your podcast and I was like, okay, I'm gonna DM her. If it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I'm willing to try, you know, spread awareness because I know it's not talked about at all. So, yeah. Well, I'm glad you did because, you know, there's a lot of issues that I monitor, you know, as part of the podcast at all levels, like collegiate, the competitive world, even though I don't really know the competitive world like that. And so even as recently, just with Mm -hmm. Cheer 2, which I still have not watched, but, you know, the young woman from that program and I still cannot believe I haven't watched it yet have you watched it I have and I was really yeah. shocked when I heard about Jada yeah when Rebel you know just signed her off because of her color and the way the person that she was she's an amazing cheerleader and that's like one of the things that I have a problem with like it's just mm-hmm. it's sad yeah we're gonna get into all of that so again thank you for reaching out I think that was brave. I probably would have been intimidated. I mean, you know, this is just a a podcast on pro cheerleading. You are pretty active on Instagram, but I did look at your video after you had reached out. And I know my heart just sank when I was thinking, oh my gosh, she quit. And I know and understand why you did quit. And we'll get into that. But it was just thinking about kind of this continuum that we have in our space, like people who, you know, start cheerleading around your age. And then you depending on what your experience is like doing that, you may or may not do it in high school. You may or may not do it in college. And I think a lot of these experiences end up repeating themselves. And so my brain immediately went to like, we've got to stop this as early as possible. And this is something that we're all impacted by. And so we're definitely going to talk about it. So that's what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's go through your story in cheerleading. So I did watch the video and I'll definitely link it so people are able to see too, but it sounded like you started when you were pretty young and then you gradually built up the skills. I mean, not having any experience prior to like, talk us through how you started off in cheer, why you wanted to cheer and we'll get to where it went a little left. Um, so basically when I was five or six, I started dance. So then I love dance. Um, mm-hmm. Dance was pretty amazing, but I was like, I kind of need something more. Like even at five, I was like, this is kind of boring. Like, you know, <laughs> I seen Pop Warner and their cheerleaders. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. It's different. It's fun. And I was just like constantly telling my mom, I want to do cheer. I want to do cheer. So she brought me to a gym and I had no idea it was competitive cheer. I just wanted to, you know, have fun and, you know, flip. So off the bat, a few weeks, I was getting new skills left and right. I didn't realize how good I was until they told my mom, they're like, oh, you need to put her on a team. Like, she's amazing. So I started off on um, level two. And level two is like back handsprings and, you know, back Mm -hmm. walkovers. So I started off on there. And I was at a really small gym. So like the true, like, huge competitive world, I had no idea of it. Like nothing outside my little gym. So my mom found brought me to a bigger gym and this is like one of the best cheer gyms ever I went to um cheer athletics so it was a huge 
weekend. Um, they have multiple locations. So I'm like, whoa, I'm seeing people throw crazy skills, fools, doubles, throwing people up in the air. I was like, what? So they put me on a level four team, um, which is layouts and um, punch fronts and full downs and full ups. So I didn't really have a lot of self-confidence, especially after seeing so many people with amazing skills. I was like, there's no way I can do that. So I had a really bad season. I had um, terrible self-confidence. I didn't realize how strict the coaches were. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, so how how old were you when you kind of moved to that bigger gym? Because I can imagine that being very, very like overwhelming. I mean, I'm thinking as green as I feel like learning about the competitive cheer world. Like if you're stepping into that as an athlete, it can definitely rock your sense of self-confidence and self-esteem as to like where you fit into that competitive world. So how old were you around the time? And Um, just so that we have some reference there. I did a private trial. I was 11 at the time. Yeah, he was like, okay, you're going to need to do this. You're going to need to do that. One of the coaches, I was like, okay. So while that's happening, there's so many practices happening. There's like different like um, floors. I think it was like three to four floors. So I was on a different floor while everybody was like just doing their routine and stuff. I came in right at the beginning of everybody's new teams. So yeah, I was flipping. Yeah, I was flipping and doing different types of skills. And they're just people looking at you like... Yeah, who is she? she you know, yeah. At the time, there wasn't, when I went, I don't remember seeing any Black girls or any Black cheerleaders there. So that kind of set me off as like really feeling like I was in a bubble, like, dang, there's mm-hmm. nobody like me here. But, you know, my mom was like, just try it out. You don't know what team you're going to be on yet. It, the coach I was with was really nice. And he put me on a junior level four team. And I think it was about, two or three black girls that was pretty much it and the whole everybody else was you know white but um, everybody was how big are these teams though um the team that I was a large and there's different sizes there's small and there's medium there's large and most of the teams there at the time were large teams so that was mainly the whole gym in general there's not really any different sizes yeah I was in a large team everybody was nice but it was also very clicky as like there's like small groups where people you know felt more comfortable with and I only had one friend on the team Uh, she was also black so I felt comfortable talking to her more but yeah our coaches were very very strict and that was definitely different for me I did not expect for coaches to be so you know strict strict when it comes to what like uh um team rules or what were they strict about like technique like if you don't do this right or if you fall on a specific skill they make you do like jumping jacks or say running around the gym and I was not used to that from my little gym I was like if you fall you fall it's okay but they were very strict when it came to those certain things but yeah it was basically practices two to three hours and I was on a smaller group, stunt group. I didn't have a front spot or anything. And that was my first time really doing like really advanced skills. So they will always critique me always on, on little things. And I remember crying every practice. Like mm-hmm. I would like my mom and I'm like, I can't do this. There's no way I can be on this team. Like I remember wanting to quit so bad, but my mom constantly pushed me. She's like, you're just not used to the environment. It's fine just keep doing you and you'll get better. So she put me in privates, um, tumbling privates, stunt privates, stretching privates. And I got better really, really fast, like really fast. To the next um, season, I was on, I was still on level four, but it was a senior level four large. And they put me as um, center flyer, which is you're in the middle and everybody else is on the side. So I'm like, what? Like, And my confidence Mm -hmm. just went up. And that's getting hate because nobody was used to a point flyer being Black. So at the time, I try to ignore it. I'm like, well, it is what it is. But I remember seeing myself trying to change my hair, like straight hair all the time. So I was getting perms, just wanting to be like everybody else. But yeah, I just realized it's fine, you know. 
I am who I am and you can't change that. So after a while, my confidence went up. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, Madison, you're amazing, blah, blah, blah. And I remember going to competition and a little white girl came up to me. She's like, wow, you're so beautiful. I've never seen a point flyer that color. And I was like, oh, well, thank wow. you. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> But it was just little stuff like that. I would just blow like past my head. And, you know, um, it was just, it was different, you know. It is hard when you are one of the only or very, very few. And I don't mean to like always think of examples in the pro space, but I do think we've made some strides. But there are times where you go into communities, like as a professional cheerleader, you might show up for a promo and you could tell by the kids' faces sometimes that they probably have never seen somebody up close and personal before mm-hmm. that that was Black. And so, I mean, there are those moments where you're like, wow, this is really, I don't even know what the word is for. Interesting is probably the best one I can think of right now. But you said that there was like, you know, just that hate that comes with, you know, I'm assuming this is pretty much like a competitive environment. Yeah. Even though you are a team, you're still competing maybe for certain spots. Did you experience any like outright racism from teammates or was it always kind of like the the undercurrent, if you will? Um, my last season, it actually honestly came from the coaches and some of the teammates that I had turned out to be a really good flyer and everybody know me for flying. So they put me on a world's team and it was probably the worst experience I've ever had in my life from cheer and just a life lesson um mm. that's when I got hate from other teams in the gym like why is she flying like why is she on a world's team I should be on a world's team just and also my mom turned out to be a team mom for our team just to help out and be more involved and she got bullied by you know some of the parents and just saying like why is your daughter on this team and just bullying her and my mom is a really sweet person so she's not the type to like speak up but mm-hmm. you know coaches they try to replace me which they did because I seen that's when I started hitting puberty and I got muscular but they seen as me being fat so it was just it was terrible I tried to lose weight not eat I tried to cut myself it was terrible and then a lot of teammates they were older than me I was the youngest on the team None of them cared. A lot of them were very rude and coaches would come up and ask me, what do you eat? Like, what's your diet? You need to lose weight. They told me basically that I wasn't flying anymore in front of the entire gym. And it was just so embarrassing. And I felt so bad about myself after that. It was just a terrible experience. And a lot of white girls were like, yeah, please take her out. She doesn't look the part. And it was just, it oh was my so- God. Yes. Sorry, I'm making so many ugly faces here, you guys. This is just where I think if you haven't listened to any episodes of Maddie, I tend... Oh, can I call you Maddie? Is it Madison? Yeah. Can I... <laughs> um, might go on a little rant here, but I just want to digest what you were saying because, you know, as a young African-American woman, when you hit puberty, um, like you said, there's just a lot of changes in your body you just basically, for people who do not know, I mean, you your muscle tone just really intensifies, I feel like. I mean, I'm no doctor, but you get thick and it's thick muscle and muscle is heavier than fat. And there's all the things you get. You might get a little thighs, a little butt action going on. And these are things that I'm assuming as a flyer would in their minds be problematic because now you're what? Heavier to throw into the air. Is that what essentially they're trying to pit it towards even though you're still probably in the best shape of your life I honestly don't think I was heavy at all I was still really really light like you can tell I was toning up but I wasn't truly gaining like like, bulking you weren't bulking up yeah and they seen they still seen as me like getting heavy and they actually gave me like some pretty weak bases on top of that so you know everything's on you if you're a flyer and you're constantly falling and there was other um stunt groups where flyers had like strong bases they had men under them like throwing, like obviously they're gonna stay up and they gave me like bases kind of like on purpose I feel like to get rid of me and it just made me feel terrible about myself and I just didn't understand I'm like why am I gaining all this everybody looks like this 
it was just, it was so bad. And I had to sooner or later realize that's just how my body is. I wasn't getting fat. I was simply like, you know, gaining muscle. Like that's literally the normal thing that a body does. It's It's very, it's natural. And again, it sounds like a lot like sabotage in terms of how they could have adjusted around stronger bases. Cause that's the part. Okay. So I'm just going to get into a little bit my brief stunting experience <laughs> when I was at Georgetown university. Um, we had a, a co-ed team, very small, totally not known for cheerleading whatsoever. We had to beg guys to join our team. We tried to say, you get to be close to the court and watch our basketball team just to get them to do it. But one thing that always bothered me about stunting was just, I could do everything right or try to, and I can still end up on the floor. There's a, definitely this trust and people have to be committed to being a base and supporting you. And it sounds, I mean, that was my lack of trust, I guess, is that I can count on this person to make sure that I'm not falling. But I'm what I'm picking up on is that the potential, if people wanted to make someone look bad, for example, they can just barely try or not really support you as a flyer. And especially if there's this narrative that your body's changing and that's why that really um, makes me upset. And I mean, that's not fair to you at all. Were you hearing messages from the coaches in addition to them questioning your diet? Were they telling you what parts you weren't looking the fit for, or, you know, I'm, I'm don't want you to relive that moment in the gym where they said it in front of everybody, but like what, what are these messages that I I'm concerned that people are hearing over and over again? And that would absolutely affect your self-esteem and sense of confidence. The practice where they did it at, I mean, said mm-hmm. that in the beginning, I'm thinking I'm just going to go and they're going to switch people around again. Um, but they turned out to have brought the new girl. I was supposed to take my place and they replaced me right then and there, like off the bat. So I'm literally standing there in practice, trying not to cry already. Like, and just trying so hard not to have a breakdown. Everybody can tell, like, I'm just, like, on the verge of, like, just tears, just pure tears. And mm-hmm. we decided to take a water break. And that's when the coaches came up to me on the floor. And they, like, the first thing they asked me, they're like, we love you, Maddie. We think that you're an amazing cheerleader. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your body. Then they just go and ask me again, what do I eat at home? They even brought my mom with me right beside me. And they're like, what do you eat at home? Like, just still asking me these questions. And I'm just like, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Like, I eat like like how I've always ate. I don't eat, eat anything bad. I've been, I was running because I was homeschooled at the time in seventh grade I was even at home running two miles every morning like it was just terrible even my mom was like she doesn't eat anything terrible at home and that's when they looked at me in my face and they were like oh we're taking you out the stunt sequence you're just not the part you don't fit the part at all and of course it was a small white girl um she was skinny and you know looked the part I guess And I remember just bawling. I was bawling so, like, just so terrible. My mom was so mad, and she felt um, embarrassed for me. She just said, well, thank you. And she kind of just dragged me out the gym because they just kept, you know, saying things. So she just didn't want me to sit there and do that. Yeah. Yeah. I was so upset. Basically, after that, um, she tried to get me to cheer and go to another gym. And at that point, I was like, they literally – traumatized me so much that's when I quit and I just decided to do school cheer I didn't even want to do school cheer my mom was like you have a gift just go out see how it is and if you don't like it then you can quit that too but it was to the point where I didn't want to cheer again like ever and that's hard for somebody that's cheered for so many years like that was my life so when I quit I felt so relieved and a cheerleader shouldn't even feel like that that's Mm -hmm. cheered for so long and my mom was honestly more upset than I was but I was just kind of like well I don't have to deal with that anymore and I don't have to deal with cheer ever again that's when I honestly hated cheer like I literally hated the sport because I'm like why why would cheer do this to me in a way you know yeah Yeah. no it's totally understandable that it would almost like kill your desire to even be associated with it especially if it's a toxic environment I mean let's be real that's really what it is and it's 
affecting you physically, mentally, emotionally. To me, it sounds almost like abuse. I mean, I'm going to just say it because I can't think of a better way of describing it. These coaches that are in these positions that have so much influence over so many young people's lives, and you're taking their dreams and you are either cultivating it or crushing it, as far as I'm concerned. It just sounds like a very, very toxic environment and just harmful messages that can stick with you if you and I do understand what you mean and like sometimes when you step away from a sport or anything that you're doing and you're out of it you kind of see things a little differently like wait a minute that was not right or there was nothing wrong with me or you know you kind of get your perspective shifts like in addition to hating the sport for a minute what are there some of the things that you felt like you realized that were issues within the sport once you had stopped Um, uh, At the time, I really struggled with that confidence. Um, I always believed everything that they were saying until three years later. I put out um, a girl from Top Gun, another cheer gym. She was a flyer and the same thing happened to her. So I'm like, whoa, like, I'm not thinking it's just me that had this issue. And I also I put it on my Snapchat and a few girls from the gym that I came from were like, yes, this happens all the time at um, our gym and the same thing happened to me I quit and there's a documentary from some of the church stream girls and there was a black girl and she was point flyer on senior elite another cheer team one of the most well-known cheer teams and she was crying she was like the exact same thing happened to her the pressure of having to be a black flyer in center and everyone constantly hit on you, wishing that you would fall. And I was like, wow, like, this is truly a problem everywhere. And the more I just started digging, like, when you look from the outside into the inside, there's so many issues and stories, and it's just, it's crazy. So I was like, I have to say something. Like, I just have to. No, you were so right to put out your, you know, Instagram video that you did and realizing that there's just something that, I'm unfortunately impact so many other people, but it's just very, uh, one, a brave step to do that. And there is some, uh, I don't want to say like strength or comfort, but really understanding that it's not just you. You know, it helps you kind of undo some of the damage when you realize that it was not something that you could have done differently per se, and that you were treated unfairly based on the color of your skin and that this is some an experience that other people are facing as well. Well, the little understanding that I have of competitive cheer and the way that these gyms are established and run and the lack of really like some sort of governing body that's really going to, you know, if you have an issue or concern that you can raise that and somebody will deal with it. Like, is that an accurate view of what these gyms are like? Like, if you have an issue or concern, there's really no way to kind of run it up the chain. Is that true or is that that's true. There's like, if there's an issue, you either leave or you have to deal with it. There's no, oh, you have to go mm-hmm. to the authorities. Like, yes, there is like a big like company where they're in charge of that type of issue. But when there's issues brought to them, it's really nothing at all that they do. You basically just have to leave or deal mm-hmm. with it. So it's really sad that you can't, the only way you can really say anything is if you put on social media and somebody else has something to say maybe at that type of you know role but other than that yeah you can't really go to anybody and say anything because it'll just be put right to the side and ignored and it's really sad that's why I didn't say anything for a very long time Mm -hmm. I didn't think that anybody would say anything and I just thought that I would be looked at as oh it's just a girl that wants to like the intention, attention and all that. Or starting trouble or complaining and all of those things too. Yeah, the gym is very toxic when I was there. So and for you to say something, you're just asking for trouble. And I mm-hmm. really didn't want that. I did not want that at all. I didn't want anything to do with the gym. I was just kind of like, oh, let's just get rid of it out of my head and just keep moving forward. That's kind of was just my mentality for a really long time. Interesting. And I know that a lot of these issues and things that we're discussing now should not exist at the pro level, but they sometimes do. And I think even with this podcast, there are points where I'm just like, this is just really sad. Like there's no, you know, way to really kind of fight against all of this stuff. But it's it's just a perspective shift because there absolutely 
are things that can be done. And just like you said, talking about it and connecting with people and and maybe getting just some emotional support because if you have to choose between cheering or doing something that you love or finding ways of coping with this BS, frankly, that you're having to deal with, I mean, at the bare minimum, you can have like a support system to deal with it. And maybe as more and more people connect, the voices get louder and maybe you're able to say, hey, here are you know, the very few black women that are in this sport or young ladies that are in this sport, you're at the top of your game. You are these few and far in between flyers that are going through the very, very same experience. And if you all collectively put together a video or calling out these various gems to say like, you can't keep telling us that it's just us. Like we are noticing a big fat pattern here and we're calling you out on it. I mean, there's different things. Don't let me sound all revolutionary and stuff, but I just think that what you're doing is very important because, you know, when you think about like the girls that are looking up to you that are in the gym or, you know, seeing you at competitions and being like, oh my God, that's possible. I can do that. I can be that person. And knowing that they're probably going to experience the same thing, like we have to do something, right? Yes, we do. There's a lot of very young African-American cheerleaders after I put out my video, there was a girl that wanted to do a lunch with me. So um, she actually cheers at the gym that I used to cheer at. So I was like, yeah, we can um, do a lunch and we can talk. And she was just telling me on and on about how many issues there are constantly that she she's only 10 and she's throwing a full like working on doubles. And I'm like, wow. And the coaches there, like when they see something so good, especially her and she's African-American, you've not seen that at all in the gym. Obviously, they're going to try and bring you down. So they put her on a level three or four team, I think. And I'm like, why? Like, why? Like, I don't understand. Like, and she cries and she's like, is there something wrong with me? Like, why am I not on this team? And I'm like, it's not you at all. I promise it's not you at all. And it's really sad. Like, and there's probably so many girls like that. And it's just Mm -hmm. really hurts my heart. And it makes me so upset. Like, how can not only coaches, but you're a grown adult. Like, these girls look up to you and you're doing it's crazy. It it is really heartbreaking to to hear this because, you know, one of the things that I enjoyed the most when I cheered professionally with the Seahawks was you know, doing our junior clinics where we would have kids from six years old all the way up to like 14, you know, come and learn routines with us and perform at a game and connecting with the younger generation of dancers was really, really impactful and meaningful to me. And we made that experience the best possible for them, all positive, just a really, really great experience. And, you know, it breaks my heart to think of people being in that position where they can influence people and in such a positive way and what you're you're feeling some form of threat or hate or prejudice that will instead of cultivating and helping that child grow and if you have constructive criticism giving it to them in a way where they can grow from it and improve like if there's skills that aren't right or you know, there's execution that's not proper that's coachable but there there's a way that you do that without tearing people down and i just I want to say, because I don't know, that this is probably a very expensive sport, and I'm thinking of all the parents, I'm a parent, you know, that are investing so much in their kids, thinking that they're getting them the experience that they need or that they want so that they can excel. And even at the parental level, I mean, this is not okay for your, you know, your children to be treated this way at a program that you're actually paying money for them to to thrive in. Like, there's definitely got to be some other solutions here. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, it takes calling people to the carpet to get their attention with the spotlight on them. But I do think this is like step one is just raising awareness and talking about it and helping people like what you did with going to lunch with that young kid, but like 10 years old, that's just so heartbreaking to think that you can be experiencing that. And you're not even mature enough to figure out how to cope with that or how to process that or, or how not to internalize that. But you being a mentor, Maddie, is, is is huge. And I hope you continue to to make yourself available and, and being willing to connect with people because at the bare minimum, that's going to just help somebody feel that they're not alone and hopefully be the beginning of figuring out what we can do to 
to change this. What's in the cards for you next? I mean, I know you would quit, which I completely understand. You're about to graduate from high school. What do you feel like is next for you? Um, well, it took a lot for me because I also do track. So I was like, Ooh, what, what event do you do? Um, I'm a sprinter. So I do 100s and 200s. But okay. yeah, that was just kind of like my side sport after I quit. But I was like, I can't walk away from cheerleading. Like, I love cheer so much. Like, there's no way I could just, you know, put that in the box already and close it. So I was just mm-hmm. like, I guess I'll try to do college cheer. So the current school that I'm planning on attending, I decided to go ahead and put in my cheer tryout video. Yes, okay. and I think in March we find out if we made it to the second round. And then in April is an in-person tryout. And I decided to go to an HBCU because I was like, yes, I have to go yes. to an HBCU. Which one are you going to? Okay, I'll tell you. Tennessee State University. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah! All right. Sorry. I'm super excited. Tennessee State University. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'm so I w- happy to hear that. Thank you. And their coaches are super nice. They actually have done competitive cheer as well. They're judges for huge competitions. So I was like, okay, that's the type of like environment I want to be in. And everybody's so mm-hmm. sweet. Why not? Oh, uh, Okay. That is my little shining light of like, (laughs) I know that we talked about some heavy stuff, but I think you're going to have a completely different experience, obviously, at an HBCU. And, you know, just I'm glad that you're going to keep doing it. I think I wrote to you. I was just like, I don't want you to just like throw this dream to the side. And I don't know if you had already gotten past it. But I was just thinking like, you can't quit. And I know that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of options when you're in a toxic environment, but to remove yourself from it. I'm a firm believer in that. Like you sometimes stuff's just not workable and you need to, there's a better place that's meant for you to be, but just not kind of letting that fire inside of you die where you just like are so smothered with all of that negative self, you know, either self-talk or just hearing these coaches voices in your brain that end up kind of trying to put that fire out. And I'm just so happy to hear that that did not work and that you're on your way to doing amazing things in college. What are you going to study? I'm planning on studying marketing and I'm really in the state. So that's kind of like my goal when I get out of college and um, yeah, it's marketing. I'm really excited. I'm excited for you. And I'm so glad again, I wish you the best with the rest of the tryouts process. I'm sure you'll be fine. You have to keep me posted and let me know though. I want to, I want to hear (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the official I have made the team and I just think you know it just continue to look at ways of giving back to these younger kids that might be going through it maybe we can brainstorm <laughs> together of like you know ways of connecting everybody you do you follow black girls cheer yes I love oh, their you do. oh I love their king too yes so I mean maybe there's just other sites that are similar to that too you know for the competitive cheer space but using social media to connect with people and just being that voice and being that inspiration for people to to speak up too. I mean, it's happening. Unfortunately, it's happening at every level, but I think for people to realize that there's a community and maybe those collective voices getting real loud together will make more of a difference. But I just applaud your journey and where you're landing. And man, that makes, I'm smiling again. I was like <laughs> snarling earlier, but let's end on this note. Like if you could wave your magic wand in thinking of how these gyms are run or maybe what gyms need to form new gyms or whatever, like what would you do to change the sport for the better? I would definitely change the social media aspect. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of people who tend to put their opinions out there and constantly just bring people down. I would say change the hiring of coaches like, are they positive? Are they negative? Like what type of vibe and, you know, what type of personality do they bring to the table? And if there is anything terrible or wrong that somebody has, like an issue, there needs to be a better authority where somebody can go to, to not even be scared to say how they feel and keep that in. Well, you haven't seen um cheer, but the person, he was um Jerry and he was on the Ellen show a huge mm-hmm. model. He's a sex predator. And yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, 
the boys were too scared to say anything. Like, it shouldn't even have to be like that. And when they did say something to the cheer authorities, it took them weeks, weeks to even Forever. get back. Yes, like, it shouldn't yeah. even be like And that's the type of stuff that definitely need to change. And, you know, maybe more Black cheer gyms. There's one around here in Charlotte. Um, they have a YouTube channel. And, you know, it's like little stuff like that just to change, you know, cheer world in general change the dynamics for sure yes that story about jerry was so disturbing and just hearing about similar situations and how long it took for it to be handled appropriately if it was even handled appropriately that's just got to change absolutely has to change and it's like you said beyond just are they sexual predators i mean that's huge obviously, but just kind of their mm-hmm. coaching style. And like you said, their, their belief system and what their relationships are, you know, with yeah. their athletes. And I think sometimes maybe it's the competitive nature of the sport and the focus on winning or whatever, but I think you can, hopefully it'll inspire other people to get into coaching too. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? As you know, some way of giving back and being that great example of what a coach should be in the way that they're treating you know, the athletes and treating everybody fairly and running the gym with some sense of, with some sense of fairness. I mean, I get it that it's a competition, but I think there are ways, like you said, where it can be very political and not necessarily the most fair and just way of managing a team. And we see that in the pro space too. So again, these are things that I know carry over, um, but it's good to hear your perspective on what should change to make it better. And hopefully you'll be part of that change as you grow and continue to excel in your sport too. I mean, I know that there's so many ways of giving back with some of these programs and, you know, mm-hmm. with the volunteering and coaching. And so at whatever level that you're at, I hope you continue to to be a great example and role model. We're younger than you that are still in this space because like you said, you love cheer and there's, you know, so many people that love the sport that mm-hmm. need that additional support so that they don't walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would love to um give back. And this is a great start. Thank you so much for having me. This is like oh, a start for me to, you know, spread awareness. And it honestly gave me a boost of confidence because at the time I was trying to spread things, and, you know, it wasn't really getting out there. So for you to like reach out to me, it made me so happy because I honestly mm-hmm. contacted like 30 podcasts and only like two or three reached out to me so I was like I might just give up on this you know oh, no. kind of <laughs> okay, that so- makes me so happy no <laughs> I mean it's my pleasure to support this message is very important to me again one that I was always curious about so you thank you for helping me understand this world a little bit better too but just don't give up I mean shoot when we started this podcast we weren't sure if we had like five listeners, frankly, you know, and talking about things that were really important to us at the time. But, you know, it can be scary when you start to speak up. And especially if you talk about things that are like, where people can kind of roll their eyes like, oh, here we go, you know, like a problem or an issue or another rant that Makiba's on. But, you know, it's stuff that needs to be said. And I think you just feel better when you get it out. And I think... Now you have a whole community of pro cheerleaders and aspiring pro cheerleaders that are hearing your message. And they probably, you know, people have little sisters, cousins, family members, friends that are involved in these sports as well. And so I think your experience is going to hit and touch a lot more people. So I just thank you for your time sitting in your car in the dark talking to me. (laughs) Um, I really thank you so much. I'll definitely let you know how my journey goes. Yes, you will. And we'll be in touch before then, too. Definitely. Thanks so much for listening to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. You can follow your favorite podcast on social media at Pro Cheerleading Podcast on Instagram, at Pro Cheer Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can support your favorite podcast on Patreon. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sidelines.